In 2015, psychology professor Jonathan Haidt and free speech activist Greg Lukianoff published The Coddling of the American Mind in The Atlantic. The article argued that speech codes, trigger warnings, and safe spaces on college campuses were disastrous for education and mental health. It quickly became the most read article in the history of the magazine. And now they've expanded it into a new book with the same title. Lukianoff is a lawyer by training who heads FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which fights for free speech on campus. Height teaches at New York University and is a co-founder of Let Grow, the free-range parenting advocacy organization, and Heterodox Academy, which promotes intellectual diversity among faculty. I sat down with them to talk about why they believe that good intentions and bad ideas about the supposed fragility of young people is setting up a generation for failure. Greg, John, thanks for talking. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure, Nick. Early on in the book, you uh, posit that what is new today is the premise that students are fragile. Uh, explain what you mean by that. Well, uh, several years ago, and this is what led uh, me and John to write our original article back in uh, 2015 for The Atlantic, uh, also called Coddling the American Mind, uh, we started seeing a trend in which students were sort of medicalizing the excuses for why they were demanding censorship. And just the fact that students were uh, you know, demanding new speech codes, demanding um, trigger warnings, demanding you know, microaggression type policies. That and, and this was different I, I, as you're the head of FIRE, yeah. a free speech group for uh, higher education you know, uh, on campuses. It was new that students were calling for this as opposed to it being imposed on them. I say this every time, but it, it bears repeating. I started at FIRE in 2001. Um, for my entire career, the main censors on campus were administrators. Um, sometimes professors got into the act. The most tolerant, the most free, free, free speech group on campus were the students themselves. And it seemed seemingly overnight, sometime around 2013, 2014, we saw this big discontinuity. Suddenly it was the students themselves who were asking for disinvitations, new speech codes, all of these restrictions. But what was also strange about it was increasingly they were making a sort of medicalized argument mm -hmm. that I need to be protected from offensive speech because it can harm me in some some sort of medical way. And that's why John and I wrote the original article. So students today uh, define themselves as fragile. Some of them do, unfortunately. Um, and I think, you know, I, there's also the argument sometimes that it's a rhetorical tactic. Um, and, and I think that is sometimes true. But when you see the, the, the big increase in anxiety and depression, I think there are, there are many students who really do uh, have a self-fulfilling prophecy that essentially uh, that, that's leading them to greater anxiety and depression. So the book, uh, the first part is built around what you guys called three untruths that are kind of, you know, overarching uh, background hypotheses or, or, or assumptions that are governing the way we deal with kids or the way that younger people talk about themselves. The first one is the untruth of fragility uh, and the subtitle or the slogan is what doesn't kill us makes us weaker. John, what, what is the untruth of fragility? Yeah, so my first book was called The Happiness Hypothesis. And, and I, I surveyed ancient writings and I found 10 ancient ideas that have really stood the test of time that have come down to us. And one of them, of course, is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You can find versions of that in, in Chinese in literature and Western literature. When Greg came to me in the summer of 2014 and said this strange stuff is happening on campus and students are acting as though, you know, as though if they're exposed to some idea that they hate, that it's not just going to make them angry, it's going to actually harm them. And this is the exact opposite of course, of ancient wisdom. And as we as we started working on this, as we started writing the article, I realized, you know, it's as though, you know, it's as though on university campuses, people had read the happiness hypothesis and then done exactly the opposite, like right. exactly the opposite of what the ancients said you should do to live a happy, fulfilled, effective life. Uh, and so when Greg and I teamed up to write the article, it's just so clear we can use cognitive behavioral therapy, we can use all sorts of techniques to say, well, this is, if you actually want to be strong, happy, and effective, here's how you should do it. And it's the opposite. So that was when it was just very easy to summarize that first great untruth as what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Uh, you know, my variation on whatever whatever doesn't kill me always makes me hungry. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where that leads me. The next untruth is the untruth of emotional reasoning. Uh, and the catchphrase that you used to describe that are the shorthand is always trust your feelings. Right. What's wrong about that? Always trust your feelings is uh, w one of our great untruths. And I think it's the one that people, some people will hear and they'll be like, well, that sounds right. That sounds romantic. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. Uh, that, that sounds valid. Again, back to hunger. But when you stop a while to think about it or you consult any ancient philosopher, or you look at modern psychology, it's terrible advice. 
And I'm a big proponent of, of the of cognitive behavioral therapy, and that's what the original 2015 article was largely about. But I always ask people to tr tr kind of drop the T from it, the right. therapy part of it. Because really all cognitive uh, behavioral therapy is, is learning to talk back to the wild exaggerations in your own head by being able to label them as all or nothing thinking or catastrophizing mm -hmm. or overgeneralization. We have a whole list of common right. uh, cognitive distortions in the in the book. And amazingly, if you teach yourself how to do these, um, you can actually uh, you, uh, experience decreased anxiety, decreased depression. Was there a moment when we, un like, did we know them and forget them? Or is it just that, you know, emotionalism became more popular? <laughs> I think I think it's a recurrent theme all throughout history. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, it, whenever we see um, a new movement coming in and it seems to be opposed to something that we think is valuable, it, it's usually driven by the pursuit of something else good. As we've had more diversity, especially more diversity by mental health status, there's an effort to be more sensitive, to not um, not tell people they're wrong, not say things that will upset people. And so it's usually in pursuit of a good um, but the idea that you have your experience, you have your perspective, and that's valid. Right. And nobody should criticize you for that. Nobody should challenge you. And, and that seems like a welcoming thing to do. But just imagine at freshman orientation, I've got a whole bunch of students coming and imagine the university president saying, welcome to college. Now you come here with certain prejudices and, and beliefs and feelings, go with them. <laughs> right. Don't question yeah. them. Spend four years reinforcing them. I mean, my God, what a waste of time and money. Yeah. You mentioned early on, you say, you know, there are no clear villains here, right. um, so, right. which is helpful because it is, this is, it, it's easy, particularly in, in a kind of partisan, polarized yeah. Uh, yeah. America to be like, oh, well, this is all like leftists or rightists or whatever. And they're, That's right. Yeah. So my second book was called The Righteous Mind. And uh, it was, uh, uh, and the subtitle is, uh, you know, why good people are divided by politics and religion. Um, and so the theme of it is we're, we're, we are designed by evolution to do tribal warfare. We're really, really good at forming us versus them, which will get us into the third uh, great the untruth, third which untruth I we could do it right the now. The untruth of yeah. us against them, life as a battle between good and evil people. Um, right. So that's like that's our default state. You don't, you don't have to teach kids to do that. I mean, if you just put them you know, outside, they'll figure out how to make teams and, and compete. And if you bring people together in a college and you start talking to them about life is zero sum, and the economy is zero sum. And if someone gets something, that means they took it from someone else. There's all sorts of things you can do to activate tribal thinking and turn people against each other. And what we need to do on a college campus is do everything we can to shut that stuff down, especially if we want to create diversity. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most foolish thing we could do. Put all these resources into increasing diversity, international diversity, gender, every kind of diversity you can think of, and then highlight distinctions and turn people against each other. I mean, it's, it's a recipe for turning college into a viper pit. So there, uh, speaking of college as a viper pit, and I wanna talk about where, where did these untruths come from or what are some of the ideas driving them? Uh, you bring up a, a, a neo-Marcusianism. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about Herbert Marcuse, who was a you know hugely influential thinker, particularly in the '60s counter right. '60s counterculture. Um, what is Marcusianism, and why is it problematic? In it, you know, especially as it plays out on college campuses. If you defend free speech on college campuses, Herbert Marcuse comes up all the time because he's kind of seen as the leading philosopher of a anti-free speech left. Um, he wrote a he wrote something called Repressive Tolerance in the mid '60s that was talking about if we really want to have a tolerant society, we have to actually go further than just allowing free speech. We have to actually go and punish the people who are saying the anti-progressive thing. Um, I and, and, and the idea of repressive tolerance was that the idea that you had a marketplace of ideas and everybody got a fair hearing and right. then you would hash it out, that itself was repressive because it maintained the status quo by giving the illusion of disagreement or debate. Well, no, because if it, so there are many lenses you can look at society through. One of them is power and privilege, and that's a useful lens sometimes. Right. But if you look at everything through the lens of power and privilege, and you see, and he was writing in the 60s, and you know, even though the Democrats at the time controlled the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the presidency, everything, um, his view was that conservatives were the dominant force in society. They controlled business and the military. So, okay, and, and you can- And to his credit also, I mean, Democrats in the 60s, uh, you still had true, the conservative massive Democrats segregationists, the, yes. et cetera, who yeah, were very absolutely. backward looking, That's right. Although by the time he wrote, But by the time he wrote Repressive yeah. Tolerance, that was after the that Civil Rights fame. Act. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the point is, that if you see, if you if you have this worldview, in which everywhere you look, what you see, you don't see people walking down the street. You see oppressors and victims, oppressors and victims, and then you think about free speech, 
and you say, well, if we just have, you know, John Stuart Mill type free speech, the powerful people, the right, are going to dominate, the white people dominate, dominate the people of color. We can't have that. So true, to you know, open tolerance would actually lead to repression. What we need is to repress conservative thought. And he almost says it directly. We need to Stop, shut well, down and he's coming speech. out of the Frankfurt School, uh, yeah. uh, you know, where culture is a uh, kind of epiphenomenon of economic power, right. uh, et cetera. So, like, you, you really do have to shut down the culture in order to get at the root causes right. of things. Um, and it seems to me, you know, uh, I, in reading your book, one of the things that it helped explain to me was uh, when I was in grad school in the late 80s and early 90s, there were a bunch of people, uh, literally I had professors, I went to SUNY Buffalo, who had been at Berkeley during the, you know, when Reagan was tear gassing things and shutting the campus down. Mm -hmm. Those people all loved the idea of free speech. The whole idea right, of the yeah. university was you go there and you just talk about the most batshit crazy ideas and you just, you talk it out. The generation that came in right after that were, they never mentioned Marcuse, but they were clearly sure. following that where there right? was, you know, we, we don't want an open discussion. We know what the right answers are. And the question is, how do you implement that? And how do you indoctrinate students to go out into the world and, you know, act as advanced men, advanced men and women for these things? That's right. So I think what that shows is, is the increasing incoherence when people are playing different games. So there's all kinds of games that we can play. Um, uh, and we have evolved software for each one. So one of them is called the war game or the victory game in which it's us versus them and, and we're gonna do whatever we can to beat you. And sometimes we might have to fight dirty, especially if the stakes are high. And then there's the uh, discover truth game and we can do it in groups and that's the way you know Plato, Plato's dialogues were organized in that way. People would argue, but they were there to have a good time to, to, to push against each other, knowing that that would lead them to truth, especially if facilitated by a lot of wine. So that's a very different <laughs> and game. And also that no broad's allowed, right? So you can have <laughs> okay. a really important and conversation. So that, yeah, that's right. So, so that men would not be time. distracted. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, but and the point, poets, poets also could take a hike. Yeah. yeah. Um, the point is that there's very different games that one can yeah. do. And if, you know, if, if people in university are playing a certain game uh, and it's the it's the pursue truth game and then you come in you're arguing for free speech well that's very consistent it's mm -hmm. a variation right. on the same game yep. but if other people come in and say no the point is political victory we're here yep. to fight for these goals against that party and everything we do from freshman orientation through extracurricular activities everything is organized for victory totally incompatible games it's like having tennis players and football players on the same court like it just doesn't work so, you know, one of the things that you talk about in the book are identity politics, particularly the way that they play out on college campuses. And identity politics, uh, you talk about them being based on things like race and gender rather than ideology or class. Um, explain a little bit about that because it's, you know, we, we have interest groups, right? Mm -hmm. But our but identity politics kind of a subset of how we form affinity groups or mm. what's how does that factor into all this? Well, one thing, I, I feel like that, that's one of the big differences between the book and the, uh, the article we wrote back mm -hmm. in 2015. Um, and I explain it sometimes this way. Um, in 2015, we were arguing that, you know, we're teaching a generation the habits of anxious and depressed people. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised that they end up being anxious and depressed. In this, one of the major things we added was we're also teaching them the habits of tri uh, tribalistic yeah. polarized people. And so, but when we first decided that we're going to talk about identity politics in the book, I was, to say the least, a little nervous. We'd fire, you yeah. know, I, I come from a very sort of nonpartisan, right. try to bring people together kind of background. But when, uh, when I read John's first draft of it, it was all based on very, uh, very clear, well established um, uh, psychology uh, studies that even people who look alike can be very easily taught to think of each other on, on separate teams. And now we're doing this with, you know, both with, 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 our, with our foot as, as powerfully on the gas as possible and then wondering why people feel uh, so divided. Yeah. So just, just to follow up on that, um, I think a, a key thing that we do in the book, I mean, we're wading into incredibly polarized <laughs> yeah. territory. You know, I mean, there really is a moral panic on the right about free speech on campus. So we get this, we, people when, point- When you say moral panic, you mean it's not true? No, that's the thing. Okay. So a moral panic means you have an ecosystem in which the most outrageous story is amped up pushed out, people devour it, and they, they have a kind of a paranoid view. Um, so so right-wing media has really geared up, especially since the protests in the campus protests in 2015 provided all those videos mm -hmm. of students screaming at professors, shouting obscenities at them. So there really is a, a moral panic on the right 
And then the left can look at that and say, see, oh, it's just a moral panic. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. But to say there's a moral panic doesn't mean there isn't also a really serious problem. Right. And we, you know, so surveys of current students, people are much more wary of speaking their mind. Mm -hmm. As one student said to Deb Mashik, the, the director of, of Heterox Academy, one of her students said, silence is safer. Mm -hmm. That's her guiding rule. Silence is safer. So there is a real problem. So my point is, it's an inc the campus is like one of the several main battlegrounds of the culture war. And we could go in and say, oh, Marxism and SJWs and identity <laughs> yeah, yeah. politics. But that's not, that's not what we're about. What we're about is saying, let's just try to understand this. There are no villains here. People are pursuing moral ends. Mm -hmm. So what we do both in the social justice chapter, which is chapter three, I'm sorry, the identity politics chapter, right. we cover three. And in chapter 11, we cover social justice is we say, there's something good and right here that students are pursuing. Yeah. And if they're, if they're trying to get equal rights and access for people who are excluded or feel marginalized based on identity categories, that's a justice issue. Mm -hmm. And of course, we should all support that. There's nothing wrong with organizing your politics based on car ownership or eating habits mm -hmm. or race. Those are all perfectly legit. The dividing line is between those who try to organize it saying, we are all human, we're all in this together, and some of us are being denied their rights. And that's what Martin Luther King did, that's what a lot of the great civil rights leaders did. And that ultimately wins, that actually attracts people, it lowers their defenses, and you can show them that actually there's injustice being done. So that works. Um, and you still find that, especially in religious organizations on campus, they tend to do that. But the other way is to say, let's all unite, let's all come together against them. One of the things where you talk about where these untruths come from, and you were getting at this, uh, one of the things you say is that there's a really intense political polarization and sorting process mm -hmm. that has to do with things like negative partisanship. Mm -hmm. Explain how what that is and then how that feeds into these kinds of, the inability of us to, to kind of see ourselves yeah. as common in, on yeah. campus. Political polarization is definitely one of, the, one of the common interests between me and John that, I, that I'm very exercised about. Um, you know, there was a great book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort um, that talks about how people increasingly live in, um, uh, in counties that are more politically partisan. And as people have followed that research even deeper, it turns out it's even, we're divided into city blocks. Uh, that are more politically partisan. Um, and then add to the fact that you, we have social media that actually encourage you to surround yourself by an echo chamber. They give yeah. you sort of a little dopamine rush by doing it. Um, or we've set up a situation all due to things that I otherwise think of as positive. Um, that's why we call them po problems of progress mm -hmm. in, in, in the book that are absolutely set to make us more polarized. And so this was a predictable sort of outcome um, that we saw getting worse, you know, even even 10 years ago. Um, but polarization is, is the sort of part of the secret sauce that makes us so much more intense. Although, you know, it's interesting because the political science Morris Fiorina at, uh, at Stanford um, talks about how the polarization is, is typically oversold by the media or the people it, talking yeah. about it are not representative of most people. And so when you look at a lot of major issues, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, whether it's abortion, whether it's immigration, mm -hmm. whether it's pot legalization, there are broad yeah. 60, 70, 80 percent There's a lot of ways of majorities. thinking about polarization. And yeah. if you're focusing on people's attitudes about issues, right. then I think Fiorina right. is right that you don't yeah. see a, like a giant bimodal distribution. Most people are still in right. the middle. We're not concerned with issues. We're concerned with how much people hate the yes, other side. Exactly. If you look at affective partisan polarization, that has gone steadily up yep. and has continued to go up. I think it's even sharper, I'm not sure, right. in the last two years. That's what matters. So if you're creating a diverse community, so let's suppose you have black and white on campus together, and then you do something that increases the degree to which black and white people hate each other. Is that going to help or hurt your mission on campus? Right. Similarly, if you have left and right students, you do have left and right students mm -hmm. um, in every campus. Um, and if you had, used to have some, some right-leaning professors, now there's hardly any. But if you had, if the campus generally leaned left and left and right didn't hate each other a lot, they just kind of disliked mm -hmm. each other. That was the status quo for a long time, and that kind of worked. It, and is that a, I mean, is that golden ageism to look back? I mean, I think we can all look back 20 years or 30 years or whenever we're in college or grad school and be like, well, you know, it, it wasn't perfect, but it's better than it is now. Is it, I mean, yeah. you're, you're saying look, it is objectively yeah. worse I mean, look, William, now in terms William of... William F. Buckley wrote, was a God and man at Yale yeah. in what, the 50s or 60s or something? or something, yeah. something like that, yeah. So the, the, the concerns of conservatives that yeah. there's a left-leaning professoriate, those have gone on for mm -hmm. a long time. But, um, but compared to what happens to political dissenters now, it's a lot rougher now, and mm -hmm. social media has changed that. One of the things that changed it is that there used to at least be 
the ratio uh, across the whole professoriate used to be just two to one. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout much of the 20, late 20th century, it was two to one. Uh, two to one. Um, left, right. Okay, and that's uh, self descriptions of yeah, professors whether you, more or less. Whether saying, you, um, yeah, whether you, whether the sur there are a few surveys that have looked at this, and whether you say, are you on the left or the right, or whether you say Democrat, Republican, the results are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but in the 90s is when things change, and when. Uh, and now there's a lot of reasons for that. It's the baby boom coming into the professoriate. It's also the Republican Party changes, uh, the party of Newt Gingrich changes, and that's going to turn off a lot more yeah, you, right uh, of center. Talk a little bit about Newt Gingrich is kind of one of the yeah. ghosts of this book in a very negative way. Um, how does yeah. how does Newt Gingrich yeah, kind of he's book. he's one yeah. of the guys we right we do say all yeah. around the, uh, no, that's the true. we do say there are no villains. Uh, if there was a villain, Gingrich <laughs> would be one. But and, and but, he's a professor. He's a PhD. Uh, he's a historian. He, yeah, for God's sake. Yeah. Well, a little bit of not, no. I shouldn't. I shouldn't yeah. say that. Um, <laughs> no, that's not true. But so yes, Gingrich is a villain in that he instituted changes in Congress that greatly ramped up political polarization. Now again. People do things for good reasons, and the Democrats treated the Republicans terribly for decades. Mm -hmm. And so, when his Republicans took over in '95, he wasn't going to say, "Okay, all is forgiven. Let's be not." So, you know, I understand why he did it. It's, he's not a moral villain; he just is a causal villain. Right. Now, these things would well, and it's also a react. But I mean, all of this stuff is interrelated. But it was yes. also when Bill Clinton took over. I can remember I was in grad school and. People were so triumphant that he was the first baby boomer president, and he yeah. was one of us. Uh -huh. And you know, mm -hmm. and I had an office yeah. mate who said, like, you know, we won, Nick. And I was like, I, you know, I voted for I, I don't even remember who the LP candidate yeah. was, yeah. but and, and I was saying political, but he was like, we won, and it is never going back. You have lost, and I was no. like, okay. And then within six months, yeah. Clinton was such a disaster early on yeah. that like people just stopped talking about politics, and it was actually kind of a good decade. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. but Gingrich but, was yeah. Yeah, these guys are like dark twins. They were yeah, they were very right. polarized. Well, that's figures. right. But that brings us to another another factor going on here is the change of the generations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, there is some really interesting evidence we cover it in chapter eleven that. However, the political world looks to between 14 and 21 or so is kind of a sensitive period. That tends to sort of set, you know, not in stone, but that tends to have a, a lasting effect for the rest of your life. And so the greatest generation, as it's called, they came together to fight fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, when they then went on to run the country, they did a great job of it. At least they were, I should say, they were able to work together. They had much more of a spirit of putting the country first. Mm -hmm. Whereas the baby boom generation, again, gross generalizations, there's lots of variation. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> if you're, you know, if 1968, if 1968 is in your sensitive yeah. period, uh, and then you come into government 20 years later, you're going to have a view of the left and right, which is more likely to say, if you're on the left, we've got to smash these, you know, these right. racist bastards, or if you're on the right, we've got to smash these anti-American, whatever. So. Yeah. The change of generations is a big part of the story as well. So, what happens now, though? Because the boomers are, you know, they're in their yeah. dotage. I mean, uh, is the next generation, is it, is it clear the next generation of professoriate? Because it, those aren't fourteen to twenty-one year olds. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're not the kids that you're talking about who, who yeah. are failing. Yeah. Well, the um, uh, I wanted to just yeah. uh, respond a little bit to the golden ageism, yeah. in, in a problem that you brought up. I would still, I think, both of us would still choose to live in 2018 if we were actually asked to to, mm -hmm. to, to live in any year. Um, I'd take but, the 90s. But <laughs> but that's <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, but that's why we talk about you know pr problems of progress. These are the kind of things that you can see yeah. getting worse because because other other things are getting better. And if but if you look at the data on you know uh, voting patterns, for example, in the U.S., it, it's very clear um, that we that we did have a long period of sort of centrism. Um, it, and it, it, it pops up on everything that you see uh, when you. One of the things that you talk about are rises in anxiety, depression, and other mood uh, disorders. Where is that coming from um, among kids? Because that they they go to college and then they're not quite you know they're fragile. They're not quite as resilient. Is that a real thing, or is it a function of overdiagnosis, yeah. or a mix, or yeah. you know what? We, is there yeah, something in the water? Now we looked into that very carefully. So when we were writing our article in 2014 and 2015, I was responsible for finding the stats. Is this really happening? And I couldn't do it. It was a bunch of anecdotes. It was a few weak correlational studies, because in 2014 all we had was data from 2012, 2013. But the spike, the gigantic rise in anxiety and depression began around 2012, 2013 in college. Uh, it's basically kids born after 1995, especially what, what are sometimes called Gen Z or iGen. They were raised differently. Uh, they have much higher rates of anxiety and depression. You might think it's just that they're comfortable talking about it, so it could just be an artifact. But we looked into this very carefully. Suicide rates track the same trends as self-report. 
and hospital admissions for slitting yep. your wrists or otherwise cutting your body. Yep. And it, and all the signals are consistent in saying it's especially girls. Boys are up in all these two, right. but girls are way well, up. Well, and, and you talked about how social media plays a role here. And not, not, neither of you are, I, I don't want to say alarmists. Uh, that may, actually, you may be an alarmist, but you're, you're not concerned. Social we're media concerned is, sure. is, is, is a bad thing, but rather that if you're coming to social media, what, it, what, that is what's forming your kind of early experiences yeah. versus if you come to it after yeah. you are kind well, actually, of more let's, robust. Actually, let's start with play because I think we need mm -hmm. to set this up. So what are kids bringing when they reach adolescence and then how does social media change them in adolescence? Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to start with play. So, I mean, the, the way to think about this is suppose we just decided that, you know, reading is dangerous. You know, kids could come across all kinds of bad stuff. And so... Let's not let them Virtually, read. Virtually, you know, every early novel was about how it's a really bad idea to read novels. Uh, you're there you go. Get bad there you go. Ideas okay. And then go out and ruin your life. But all right. So suppose we said no kid can read until he's 14, unless he has an adult sitting right there supervising him. So they still learn to read, but they're always watched. They're they're very restricted. And then at 14, then they can read what they want. Do we think that this might have a lasting effect? Probably it would. They wouldn't love reading as much. They wouldn't have learned as much. And in a, in a way, we've sort of done that with play because kids play, all mammals play. This is how we wire up our nervous systems. But we started deciding in the 90s, you, and you wrote that wonderful article, I thank you for sending it to me, um, uh, uh, putting your finger on this in 1997. We're becoming totally overprotective in the 90s. Right. We, we're not letting we our kids- We were child-proofing the world. That's yeah. right, that was the name of the article. So Google, child-proofing the world. Um, so uh, if, we, if we don't let kids play unsupervised mm -hmm. until they're 14 or so, and then we say, okay, now you can go out with your friends and play. But you know, at 12, you can't go out because you might be kidnapped. Right. And do we think this might have a lasting effect? Do we think this might delay maturation? What, so what, what is your take on why, why did um, childhood go from being relatively unstructured mm -hmm. to being hyper-scheduled? So, I mean, part, you know, yeah. what, what are the causes of that? I think we're seeing the effects of yeah, it, which exactly. is that That's kids right. can't kind of deal with things. Yeah. But what... what what created this new world of hyperschedule of yeah. childhood? Good intentions. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a few things. It's the combination of cable TV, which uh, and a couple of high-profile killings in the in this. Well, Aton Pates in '79, and then Adam Walsh in '81. But um, even though child killings and abductions didn't go up, our awareness of them did. And so this is the Michael Moore thesis in Bowling for Columbus. We start getting scared out of our minds in the '80s. Cable TV does this to us, but we're not. We're we're not really cracking down until the 90s. Ironically, that's right when the crime wave ends is right. in the 90s. So it's, the, it's fear, especially fear of abduction. Um, it's the increasing com competition to get into college. So now we're yeah. being, we have this idea that- oh, you you got to start listening to Mozart exactly. in the womb. Exactly, oh my God, right? that was And the, then that, uh, Baby Einstein, right. uh, I don't know if you guys use these on your kids. Yeah, no, Didn't it, work, but- <laughs> no, we, we bought one of them and it, it just, you know, it's basically, I, I don't want to, it's hard to put it this way, but it's sort of like, you know, training for, no, I shouldn't say, uh, never know, for a particular mental illness, yeah. I should say. <laughs> it's not, it's not human, it's not, um, Anyway, yeah. So, but, uh, but there's a perception that you have to start your kid, you know, at age one or month yeah, one in right. order to get into the schools, to get to where they're going to be when they're eighteen. Or there, so. there right. were a couple of really dramatic things that that, that I learned from from uh, working on this book with John, and one of the strong, one, one of the most surprising one was how well established it is that. Um, younger people need unstructured time to play. Mm -hmm. And if I look at sort of like my, my, you know, my friends who went to law school with and the way they raised their kids, you would think that this was something that no psychologist actually knew or there's no mm -hmm. research supporting it. And finding out that it's overwhelmingly supported, yeah. and, but nonetheless, every parent I know thinks they have to have their kids scheduled from 6 a.m. To, to, to bedtime is How actually good for them. How much of it is also, though, and uh, again, this, could, uh, this can be taken in, in the wrong way, mm -hmm. but how much of it is also the rise of two-parent uh, uh, career, two-career mm -hmm. households, so that you don't have, uh, you know, kids need to be supervised, or there's a sense of well, that you're not going to leave a five-year-old yeah. at home while you're mm -hmm. both at working, um, so you end it's, up putting them in more yeah. and more institutional Well, that's, that's kind of tricky. It's not so much that now that women are working, we have to put them in things. It's not right. that, because in fact, um, even though women are working 
vastly more than they did in the 50s and 60s, they're also spending more time with their kids right, than they yeah. did in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And men are spending more time. So it's it's changes in well, norms about parenting. Well, maybe the problem. That well, we're, that, you know, we're spending we have, too much time with our kids. Exactly. That's right. We that are overprotecting <laughs> them. We are overprotecting them. Yeah. So but the job of a parent, as is often said, is to work him or herself out of a job. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing that. We're basically working, our, we're, we're basically arranging things that we get to, we have to keep parenting. It's, it's foolish. And then there's also, you talked about, I mean, the, the increase in things like homework. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's not just parent. You you talk about paranoid parenting, which mm -hmm. I think most parents would agree with. That you know, and of course they're paranoid, but you know they're paranoid for good reason, right? When it comes to protecting my kid, um, but it's also things like uh, homework. Yeah, there's more homework than and, there and, used to be, and, and there's no it downward is actually yeah. the main. Yeah, problem. and there's no right. correlation between homework yeah. and academic yeah. outcomes or anything right. like that. But it, but that's how you know you're that's sending right. your kid to a good school is if they're crying every night because they have eight hours of homework. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's right. So um, if we really cared about our kids' happiness, we would do what is most conducive to mental health, autonomy, and resilience. Mm -hmm. And that is give them a lot of unsupervised time, mm -hmm. a lot of unsupervised playtime with other kids, and ideally outdoors. Part of this is the work from uh, Peter Gray, who yes, is absolutely. one of Peter your- Peter Gray at Boston uh, College. Uh, uh, is, one of your uh, uh, co-founders of Let Grow. That's we'll right. talk a little he, bit about Let Grow. Sure, and, sure. So uh, I guess we should bring in Lenore Skenazy yep. here. Yeah. Uh, the who, world's worst mom. World's worst mom. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Who let her son, uh, her son was begging to ride the subway in, uh, at the age of nine, and I think it was 2009. And she finally said, okay, you can do it. And she got him all set up and he rode, he even had to do an exchange and got home and he was thrilled. He was so excited. Um, and then she talked about this in public and, and in a newspaper column. And some people got very upset. It's irresponsible. And so it became a big flashpoint around then uh, for, for norms about parenting. But it's really important to realize the norms about parenting had changed between the 80s, let's say, when you were, it was good to let your kids out. Mm -hmm. And by 2010, if you had your kids outside and you didn't know, you couldn't see them, you could have your kids taken away from you. Yep. Not yep. everywhere, but the, but it was becoming right. normal. Who writes for, for Reason yeah. writes regularly about stories of you know parents who let their kids play in their front yard and they yeah. get front yard is not no, front yard something. front yard happens occasionally, but that's yeah. it's it's if they step off right. the property. Mm -hmm. So if they go play with other friends, if they go to a park across the street, right. then you can be arrested. And and if you think about it, like what the kid mostly needs is to learn how to be a self governing independent mm -hmm. creature. Kids need to learn how to live with liberty. And what we're basically saying is, no, you cannot start learning until you're 18. We're going to keep you in a cocoon, send you off to college, and then you're going to be independent. Although we're going to send you off to a helicopter college, which will wrap you in all kinds of protections. What is, and I just want to add, that's one of the things that I always have to explain is the connection of sort of locus of control, the idea of um, how do you avoid having anxious and depressed kids. And if you, if you look at people who feel like they have no control over their own life, of course they feel depressed yeah, yeah. and anxious. And so sometimes when people will bring up like that we're bashing like a generation, we're like, first of mm -hmm. all, we're talking about the parents and the structures around, around these yeah. students. And I actually feel terrible for a lot of these kids because one, uh, the ones who are going to the fancy schools grow up in a pressure cooker um, where they're sort of pointed like a rocket towards these, yeah. towards these top right. schools, but never given a sense of they can handle their life on their own, which is of course a formula for depression, anxiety, all these uh, troubles that we see. People That's are right. having fewer kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people are also having kids when they're older. And is are older parents, do they tend to be more paranoid for X, Y, or Z hmm. reason? Th yeah, that I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know, don't know about that. Interesting, uh, definitely yeah. worth looking into. For but sure. I think the decline of family size is very important. This is happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have five kids and the other neighbors <laughs> all have four or five kids, A, yeah. there are a lot of kids around, <laughs> and B, if one of you, God forbid something bad happens, yeah. you're not left childless. Yeah, you're an I mean, heir and a spare. Yeah, that's I mean, right. This is. Yeah. So yeah. this is what we call problems of prosperity. Mm -hmm. As we get wealthier, we have fewer children. We invest more in each, uh, and we are, you know, we see, as you see in China, with you know four grandparents on one, ch you know, all the hopes ride in that child. And so part of what's happening is, as a social psychologist, I would say, yeah, we want our kids to be happy, but we also want us to be prestigious. We want prestige, mm -hmm. and if those two conflict, we might actually go with our mm -hmm. prestige, and we want our kid to bring us prestige. And the fewer kids you have, so this is this is not across all the social classes, but right. middle class and above, there's an incredible focus on getting into college. And so if you combine really bad psychology, which is don't let your kids waste their time playing, that doesn't get them into college. Yeah, we got to be we learning the tutoring. Challenge. Yeah, that's right. We're going to cram them with, with all kinds of supervised activities. So what you're doing is you're taking away the thing they need most and giving them things that won't make any difference. And then, you know, it actually doesn't bring, well, yeah. it actually does bring you prestige if you get them into a, an elite college, 
but then they're depressed and not very effective there. Well, let's talk a little bit about what is to be done. What are the obvious redress yeah. uh, well, factors? Here? I think the, fir the, the first thing that John can speak to the best is uh, free-range parenting. I mean, that, that's yeah. step one, essentially. Yeah, yeah so we, what we have to do is we have to break it into sort of three buckets. Mm -hmm. And so one of the themes of our book is that this is a really complicated and interesting sociological problem. We say that there are six different causal threads. We have six chapters and six different causal threads that all came together. To, to change the culture on many campuses. So we have to divide it into what's happened to kids before they get to college, what are we doing at college that brings out the worst in some kids, and what's happening in the larger national political and media ecosystem, which includes social media. So it's three different buckets. So I'll, I'll do the kids, you do the college sure, major. Sure. So the kids, as Greg said, the most important thing is the free range parenting. And so this is why, uh, so Lenore Skenazy was, she wrote this wonderful book, Free Range Kids. Um, and Daniel Shookman, who's the, the chairman of the Board of Fire, yep. came to me to say, you know, we're sort of losing the battle for hearts and minds on free speech in college. We need to actually be working at younger ages. And I said, well, we need to get Lenore to be, you know, to ramp up her operation. Yep. She needs to really, you know, have an organization. And so Lenore agreed to do it. I mean, she, you know, she doesn't like to organize things, but <laughs> but she's very passionate about her cause. And so you know, we said, well, well, we'll get an executive director. And so Tracy Tomaso is the executive director of Let Grow. So if you go to letgrow.org, it's a wonderful set. We have all kinds of suggestions because it's really hard to do this on your own. That's the thing. Like, I, like, I've been so, you know, once I read Lenore's work a few years ago, I'm trying to be more free range, but it's really hard to do it alone. Yeah. I can send my kids out to the park, but there aren't any other kids there who are unsupervised. She can't, my kids can't find a group. So Lenore has all kinds of ideas for how do you create a play club? How do you get kids to meet up in a park? Um, how do you give them more time and space to play at school? So, so, that, so a, a, a significant portion is kind of really operationalizing the, the uh, insights of people like Peter Gray and the sensibility mm -hmm. of Lenore exactly. to have a less you know, kind of scheduled childhood. That's right. Kids have to have huge amounts of unsupervised time where they're responsible for themselves, where they might get lost. And now since they have an iPhone, they, can, they should be able to navigate themselves home. But the kids have to have a lot more unsupervised time. The younger kids have to have a lot more play time. And we all have to back off on their conflicts. Now, bullying is a complicated thing. We, we obviously don't want bullying that happens repeatedly over days, so, uh, but, but it's complicated. We don't want to be intervening in their conflicts so much. Yeah, and, and before we go on to the, the college uh, part of this, how, how do you, as, as a psychologist, how do you um, figure out, like, you know, there was bullying in the past, mm -hmm. and it, by all indications it was worse. I mean, it's actually yeah. getting less oh, yeah. bad, but we take it more seriously. Yeah. But how do, you, how do you make sure that you're not just kind of creating a Hobbesian nightmare and you're just like, oh, just shake it off? Because that's also problematic. Well, yeah, so there's a difference between a Hobbesian nightmare and, uh, and a place that uh, is, is not like La La Land. Mm -hmm. um, so the you know I think the best argument we can give is what happened with peanuts and peanut allergies. So the immune system is anti-fragile. It requires exposure to dirt and germs. It has to learn what's friend and what's foe. But because some kids had peanut allergies, very few, but it happened, we started saying we got to protect kids from peanuts in the 90s. And then as and then the rates started going up. So we had to protect them even more, and the rates went up further. And only in the last few years has the evidence come in from a controlled experiment, a large controlled experiment, the LEAP study, learning early about peanuts, showed conclusively <laughs> that- Was that man. put out by like the cashew industry or something? <laughs> but. They divided, they took kids who were at risk of, of, allerg of allergy, they had other allergies. Half of them, they exposed them to peanut dust from on a, a, a puffed rice, a puffed corn snack that has peanut dust on it. So if you give these at-risk kids peanuts, their rates of peanut allergy go way down. And so in the same way, if you let kids out on the playground, but you make it incredibly safe so there's no risk, they actually don't learn as much as if there are, for example, tree stumps. Lenore points out how there's like guidance. Tree stumps, rocks, everything must be cleared because it presents a tripping hazard. Really? Kids can't run through the woods and learn to step over rocks? Yeah. And so, you know, on the playground, yeah, we don't want the kind of bullying that destroys a kid's confidence that makes them not want to go to school. And that the point is that it goes over multiple days. That we have to do something about. But we are so, in reacting to real bullying, we now jump in whenever kids have conflicts. That's a really bad you're, idea. You know, one of the things, uh, the three of us are, you know, of the same socioeconomic class, uh, you know, background, we're all white. Is there, you know, does this make sense? And we're all male. Uh, does this, yeah. is this, you know, just we're, like we're trying to preserve 
a vestige of a world in which you know we didn't have to work that hard and things kind of went our way because to do do women do uh, minorities mm -hmm. uh, experience things in that same way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at everything through the lens of privilege and power, it's obvious that we're doing this not because mm -hmm. we care about these issues right. and have devoted the last ten or twenty years to working for free speech and ancient wisdom and political depot. Not because of that, but because we want to preserve our privilege. You might think that, but I think even if that was true. Even if our motivation was entirely selfish, it's still true that everyone is anti-fragile. Whether you're black, white, male, or female, if you are overprotected, you will come out more fragile. If you are encouraged to just believe your feelings, you will come out less a less good critical thinker. So the great truths and the great untruths are equally true regardless of race or gender. So and make of as it what you, you will. I mean, as you point out in the book, uh, the rates, particularly for for girls, uh, much the higher, social much outcomes, higher. negative right. social whatever outcomes we're doing, it's having a much bigger impact on girls. Which is also kind of, uh, I mean, paradoxical because on another level, women are doing better than ever in terms of mm -hmm. earning pay and, mm -hmm. and salary and and having more opportunities. Yeah. Talk a bit about then in the college context, sure. and also throw in talk about the cognitive behavioral element to this because that's I mean there's a the part of the book which is almost I, I wouldn't say it's self-help but the stuff about the cognitive behavioral therapy yeah. conversations it, it seems really different and new well I definitely have friends who, for, for whom self-help is a bad word mm -hmm. and for me I've always wanted to write a book that that talks about freedom of speech as self-help effectively mm -hmm. and stoic philosophy for example mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to how we can reform colleges how, what, what, what we can do better at colleges um, it's funny that I, I run into people who kind of like throw up their hands, like they're just lost causes, you know, there's mm -hmm. nothing we can do. And of course, to me and John, we're like, yeah. we don't notice, notice this particular problem around 2013, 2014. Yeah, it started in we, one academic year. Yeah. We, we, this is new and we, we, we haven't even done basic things to make it better. Now one, and this sometimes surprises people that we say this, but we've got to take the psychological issues going on campus more, not yeah. less seriously. Um, university uh, uh, psycholo psychology services are kind of overwhelmed, but there are other resources, sometimes even in apps, um, that, that you can give right. to students who are in trouble. And I'm a big booster of CBT because I've personally benefited from it. Um, it has great research uh, backing it up. And what's great about it too, it, it is also something you can practice on a, da on a daily basis. E they even make apps that allow you, to, allow you to do that. So one, we have to take actually the psychological issues on campus more seriously than we currently are. But when it comes to issues like freedom of speech, academic freedom, when people throw up their hands that there's nothing to be done about uh, what's going on campuses, most colleges don't even have um, uh, orientations that seriously address uh, the, the sophisticated concepts of uh, that undergird freedom of speech, uh, inquiry, um, uh, academic freedom. Um, it, and if you haven't even done that step yet, you can't really blame students for not knowing a lot about it, which actually naturally brings me to uh, John and Heterodox Academy's wonderful... Um, uh, the Open uh, Mind Program. Uh, but also the, the, the graphic oh, model. Oh, yes, uh, yes. And, That's and, right. Uh, talk about out. Heterodox Academy briefly. What, what sure. is its function. Yeah. So Heterodox Academy is something that I started with uh, Nick Rosencrantz, a, a, a law professor, and uh, Chris Martin, uh, a grad student in sociology, when we had each, all of us, we'd each written papers about how declining political diversity in our fields is, is damaging our research and uh, the education we give our students. And so we thought, hey, we should actually you know, get together here and keep attention on this issue. Uh, Nick is on the right. Uh, Chris is on the left. I'm a centrist who votes Democrat. So this was not a partisan issue. This was a people who care about their the, the research in their fields, and um, and so we put up this site, and it was really just to encourage faculty to think about the need for viewpoint diversity and challenge, and and to defeat orthodoxy in every field. And it went live on September tenth or so, twenty fifteen. Coincidentally, a month after our article came out, and a week or two before the protests at Missouri, and then Claremont McKenna, and Yale, and Amherst, and Brown, and everywhere else. So just before everything blew up. So 2015 is really the pivotal year for a lot of stuff. So we were really formed just to promote viewpoint diversity among researchers, but it turns out it's a big issue for students too. And so um, as we went on in this and seeing the way students are very passionate politically, and the way this somehow times can suppress open discussion on campus, people are afraid to air dissenting views, even those on the left are afraid to air dissenting views. So I thought, you know, we need to put some good ideas out there. We need to expose people. As Greg was saying, we're not teaching people about the value of viewpoint right. diversity or freedom of speech. And so John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, one of the greatest books in the Western tradition, chapter two, so it's five chapters in, chapter two is this gem on free speech 
but it's kind of long and it's got a lot of obscure stuff. So Richard Reeves, who wrote a biography of John Stuart Mill, he and I um, edited it down, just chapter two, edited it down to half its length, so 7,000 7, word essay. Uh, and then it's beautifully illustrated by Dave Cicerelli, who really captures the metaphors about like the power of shame. This is not a book about censorship by government. It's a book Mill was writing about social censorship. Um, so we make this book free. If you go to heterodoxacademy.org slash mill, you can download uh, the PDF for free, a Kindle is three dollars and then the art book is expensive to print so this is twenty dollars yeah. um, but our hope is that every high school senior and or every entering freshman will read it doesn't take long to read yeah. will read and understand these amazing arguments from 1859 that are yeah. just as relevant today same year as origin species in the book in the coddling of the american mind you pay special attention to the university of chicago yep. president's recent kind of restatement of, of, of an open university. What, what was he proposing and why is that yeah, a, a good reform? At FIRED, you know, we have a whole uh, bunch of things that we'd like universities to do almost as first steps to start addressing problems with conformity and free speech, but also, incidental, not incidentally, the, the mental health problems we're seeing on campus. One thing that any campus uh, can do that really shows that it's serious about viewpoint diversity, really serious about uh, debates across lines of difference, is a, a pass of something like the Chicago Statement. Um, at this point, nearly, I think, uh, about 40 colleges across the country, a little fewer than that, um, have passed some version of the Chicago Statement that was originally written, of course, at University of Chicago, um, updating academic freedom um, norms for the uh, for, for the age of trigger warnings and disinvitations. Mm -hmm. It's it's it, it's absolutely fabulous. The other thing that universities, of course, could do is is get rid of their speech codes. Um, mm -hmm. There's been seventy plus lawsuits over the years against uh, campus speech codes. Amazingly, there's still about 30% of them have what we call red light speech codes at fire, which just mean really laughably bad ones. Um, and universities, uh, even just out, out of their own self-interest, should be uh, uh, should be getting rid of these speech codes. And one thing we have been seeing that is a little that is actually sort of a little glimmer of hope is that we're seeing a lot more um, university presidents, a lot more professors taking the problem of free speech on campus more seriously. Um, now, as we're seeing in some cases, some of their friends getting in trouble right. uh, and actually experiencing the, the, the reality of being afraid of having a single verbal misstep on Twitter or in class. As a, as a you know, as a, I was going to say a practicing academic, that's <laughs> not quite right. I, I mean, as a, as a university professor, do you feel that um, the kind of academic freedom uh, understood as your, your ability to research whatever you want is that growing, is it shrinking, or is that a different issue? Right. Well, there's two separate issues. One is my academic freedom to study what I want. Um, NYU would never restrict me in any way doing that. Uh, and I'm at the business school, and I have tremendous freedom to study whatever I want, and I've had the full support of the two deans that I've had. So in terms of my freedom to study what I want, it's perfect. But now I'm at a stage in my career when it's, I'm finding that moral psychology can help us understand why so many institutions are malfunctioning, our politics, our universities, and now it's spread, these norms are spreading into corporations. So a business school gives me a great, a great place to be to actually apply these ideas. So it's been really fun. But the other piece of it um, is not that so much the academic freedom of the professor, it's what happens in the classroom, that I think has changed for me and for a lot of professors. When our article came out in 2015, a lot of professors were saying, oh, come on, that's, you're just, you know, there's like 10 anecdotes at 10 different schools. Now, when, you, when I travel around, you talk to professors in private, most of them either have a story of their own class where they said something perfectly innocent and it blew up and they were being called in front of committees, you know, or it happened to a friend. I mean, now everybody knows there's, there's a problem. It's not necessarily at, at most schools. Most schools are not selective. They're two year. There's all sorts of reasons. But at the elite schools, this is now very, very common. Mm -hmm. And this is leading to a lot of distrust. Students don't trust their professors because they're looking for microaggressions. Professors don't trust their students because they can be turned in for microaggressions. In every bathroom at NYU is a sign giving three ways to report me if I say something that someone thinks is biased. Therefore, I no longer take risks. I'm a oh, boring I you were professor. Say I no longer use the bathroom. <laughs> <Yeah. in NYU. laughs> and, and it's gotten even worse. Well, the, probably the most recent trend that we've seen is actually uh, right-wing mobs coming after professors too. Uh, so we talk a lot about in, in the book about people getting in trouble. You know, even even just tremendous internet scorn for an article they were, they, they wrote, which might in some cases actually be retracted in the face of of, of, of contempt. Uh, you, you know, coming off of social media. So it was, there was already a pretty bad situation when it was just internal to the university. Add to that the fact that we now have this, let's go after this professor, let's get this yeah. professor fired. Well, and, and you, you point out, I, I believe it's Turning Point USA, a, a kind of Trump-loving yeah. right-wing group that yep. has created professor watch lists, right. which 
You know, I, I, I have to say, I mean, the, the, the quality of their work is laughable. On a certain level, I kind of like the idea of being able to know more about professors, but this is really kind of McCarthyism, yes. or, <laughs> or you talk about the witch hunts and the cultural revolution under Mao. This is like really fucked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's definitely you know the, the right wing sort of outrage uh, machine. Um, it can lead to uh, you know things that professors actually say in some right. cases that they're they're used to uh, being in their bubble yeah. where it's just mm -hmm. kind of accepted. Now it's colliding with sort of like the yeah. the, the right wing outrageous sphere, and it's and, and the results. Are I had lovely. a couple of professors who were on an earlier version of this uh, put up by David Horowitz, the you know Ramparts left wing editor, then who uh, you know became a super right winger in the yep. uh, 90s and 2000s, and it was. You know, it was both a badge of honor, but also chilling. Yeah. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it doesn't seem, uh, it, it's not a good way to have a serious uh, yeah. university or academic well, culture. That's right. So some people get into the mindset of playing the war game. Let's attack, attack, attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and that tends to just make people get defensive. Um, I don't think we're going to improve universities by attacking them. Um, we think that universities have tremendous moral and intellectual resources. Mm -hmm. um, I guess Bill Clinton said, uh, famous for saying, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the same thing about universities. There's nothing wrong with universities that can't be fixed by what's right with them. We have incredible research on how do you do diversity, on how do you foster a good learning environment. We have research on leadership. So we have all kinds of ideas in the book for what universities can do to draw on research, to not give into political pressures. Right. They're being pressured in the political game to implement this, that, and the other training program, which generally either doesn't work or will backfire. But if we had a more empirically based program to create a good learning environment, we think it'll work. So just two very simple things. Uh, one is the incredible importance of good, clear leadership early on. This was the theme at the Heterodox Academy Conference where mm -hmm. we had President Zimmer of Chicago, mm -hmm. but many of the administrators said it. If you don't set the norms clearly up front, that this is a place where, yes, we respect everybody, we care about diversity and inclusion, we will, we will, uh, you know, we're, we're concerned about anybody who's being excluded, but that includes we allow people to speak. And if you shout down someone, if you stop someone from speaking or listening, that is such a violation of our core values that you will be expelled. If you just say something like that up front, then you are not going to have problems. So leadership is absolutely crucial. We talk about that. And then another, I think one of our simplest uh, uh, recommendations, which is, I, I hope will provoke a lot of discussion, is we don't think 18-year-olds should be on campus. That is, there's been a very steady increase in when uh, people reach levels of maturity. This goes back to the 80s and 90s. It's been going up and up and up. And that's sort of a normal part of becoming a wealthier society mm -hmm. is childhood. You know, there used to be it's no adolescence. Yeah. You know, it, mm -hmm. so adolescence is lengthening and right. lengthening. And the, as the book iGen shows, Gene Twenge says, in, on, on many measures, 18-year-olds today are like 15-year-olds several decades ago. They, you know, 18-year-olds today are less likely to have gone out drinking, to have had a boyfriend or girlfriend, to have had a job. They've been home a lot on their devices. They are not at the same place maturity-wise. So are you proposing uh, that we push college back? Yes. A year or two of some sort of activity away from the home before you go to school. It'd be so and, good and for everyone. Greg, as the libertarian yeah. in this dynamic <laughs> I, I, to it, please I make, make a, clear it's not, I make you're a not talking about national service. Of, of, of this, which is essentially, I mean, you know, I was someone yeah. who started working when I was 11. Um, I think that d definitely there are 18-year-olds who are absolutely mature enough to be to be on campus. I do, however, think that um, if if we normalize gap years, if we normalize the idea of, of, taking, of working for a year, particularly like in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, it would lead to less of the problems we see today. And at FIRE, I see this coming partially from the fact that uh, the constituency that so often gets in trouble on campus are the, the quote-unquote non-traditional age yeah. students, the ones who served in the military or went back to school in their 30s. But they're, uh, they end up getting in trouble for what I consider to be kind of good reasons, because they're not as easily um, uh, told what to do. They're not, they, ha they have a sense of, they have a locus of control. They have a sense of maturity that, that someone is uh, oftentimes isn't going to have at a younger age. So I think that having sort of the, normalizing the gap year would, would yeah. create would be a very good thing. Just to defend myself here, I wasn't <laughs> saying, I'm not saying to a libertarian yeah, organization yeah. we need a federal law. No, I'm no, I know that. If the I, Ivy yeah. League schools, if the most prestigious right. schools, if the University of Chicago started saying, we will give preference to people who've taken a year or two off. That's all it would take. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And cool. then they would find 
that their students are much more ready to learn, much more ready to encounter diversity of views. And it was absolutely true when I went to law school. The ones who, who actually took some time off, um, you know, the, the ones who just came out of school yeah. were, were the people who were like, oh, this is so much work. Yeah. Meanwhile, oh, I'm so, worried about a test. Yeah, and no, meanwhile, so, yeah I, I had a similar experience working a couple of years before going to grad school. Grad school was a uh, kind of a vacation. Well, totally. I was, yeah. I was kind of like, you know, one of my best friends was a guy who was a carpenter for 10 years before yeah. law school. And both of us were like, so you're, you're frightened of the fact that we have to read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and it's pretty brutal. But, well, we will leave it there. We've been talking with Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. The new book is The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Thank you so much, Donald. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.